Hello, everyone. Glad to see you all here. Thank you for being here. Christians, loved ones, saints, the Bible calls you. Some of you, at least. <laughs> uh, before we get into scripture, uh, I want to just talk real quick, kind of big picture item. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul writes to Timothy, telling Timothy, the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, pass these things on and trust them to faithful men who are able to teach as well. Now, one of the things that I'm especially passionate about in the church is raising up men to leadership. It, it's, it's an overwhelming deficit in the church, uh, and it's a great need, and I am on mission to raise up more men. Over the past several months, uh, I, I have been meeting with Ben Williams, preparing Ben to do his first official sermon, uh, and that'll be in April, so a couple months from now, and I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. Uh, we're well underway in the process. We've got a few more, more steps to take. Ben uh, has expressed interest and ability in teaching and, and wanting to give the word. And as a church, we want to foster that. We want to celebrate that. We want to encourage that. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to be praying for Ben as he goes through that process, um, mostly because he has to work with me. So lots of patience for Ben. I don't just say that also for Ben, though. I say that because I want to make it clear that the Bible holds all of us to a standard where we are expected to keep growing. We're, we're to use our gifts in a way that is to serve the church uh, and learn how to use them. And that's exactly what Ben is going through. Now, when I finish this process with Ben, uh, and Ben is preaching more regularly and is, is confident and able to take a text from Scripture and deal with it clearly and accurately and skillfully, then... I'm probably going to find one of you men to ask you to do the same thing, to go through the same process. Now, I know, I know that it's scary and not everyone can preach and teach. I know that. But I, I also think maybe more often than not, it's not inability as much as it is fear. Uh, so if that's something perhaps the Lord is putting on your heart, your heart to consider, then let me give you your first assignment, uh, which is the very first assignment I give usually when I disciple people is is to read the whole Bible, to have read the whole Bible. Now, unbeknownst to some of you, you're already doing that, and you didn't know that was part of my process, so it may just be that the Lord is perhaps calling you to such a task. And so again, let me just be encouraging you to be praying for Ben, be praying perhaps the Lord is calling you to such a thing, be praying for our church, that the Lord would bring people that, um, that are wanting to not just be hearers of the word, but also doers. All right. Now let's pray, and then we'll, and we'll get into our text. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you grateful and thankful just for the ability to meet and discuss your word. Uh, Lord, we invite you here today with us and ask for your spirit and for your wisdom to discern your word well. And we love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. <clears throat> we, uh, we have been slowly studying our way through the book of Titus. Uh, we, we have this lesson that we're currently on, and then we have the next one, and then, then we'll be done with Titus, and we will have, as a church, gone through our first New Testament book together, our first Bible book together as a church, and that's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of exciting. Uh, last time we left off, we were in chapter 3, verse 1, having looked at the last verse of chapter 2 and then the first verse of chapter 3, and we, in that lesson, we talked about how um, Christians relate to authorities. We, we looked specifically at Christians in relationship to their governments, and we talked about the scriptural justification for where, to, where a Christian is allowed to disobey, according to scripture. We talked about how in, in that situation, any sort of lesser authority that would lead you or command you to sin or dishonor the Lord in some way, uh, we, we not only have license to disobey, we also have responsibility. So, for example... When a government is commanding a church that they are no longer to gather and worship, even though scripture explicitly tells us to in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. When the government is, is telling us how close we can be to one another in worship, or when they're telling us what we can wear while worshiping, or what we can teach by calling it political. All of those things are examples of the government overstepping their God-given jurisdiction and thus cannot and should not be obeyed. Now, if you're interested in that, um, 
more full type lesson, and you can go back and, and watch that from last week. This week, we press on. So in Titus chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at verses 2 through 8. Verses 2 through 8. So I'm going to begin by just reading the section we're dealing with. I'm going to include verse 1, uh, even though we already talked about it, just because it fits in the flow of argument here. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and following. It says, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we will be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. All right, so as we have already noted uh, in our study, one of the main tasks that Titus has been instructed by Paul, who, who wrote this letter to him, is to deal with the individual behavior of the Christians on the island of Crete. We talked about how that begins in verse 2, or chapter 2. In the first 10 verses, he, he laid out kind of a list of do's and don'ts for various groups of people in the church. And then in verses 11 through 14, we talked about the theological basis for why we would do that. That thought more or less continues into chapter 3. So that's what's happening here. We're just kind of continuing the same sort of moral standards that Titus is setting before the church as, as do's and don'ts. Now, we already looked at verse 1 last week, so we'll, we'll skip that one. But verse 2, <coughs> verse 2 says, to malign no one. Or literally, in Greek, it says, to not blaspheme. Or to speak evil against, is the idea. Now, this one is a little bit tricky, I think. It's tricky because it sounds straightforward, and in some sense it is. In some sense, it's axiomatic, it's self-explanatory. That is, we don't speak evil. But I also think perhaps we load too much into this that we shouldn't. And here's what I mean by this. What this doesn't mean, what this cannot mean, is that Christians are not allowed to rebuke or identify evil or call out wicked people or wicked behavior. And we know that it doesn't mean that. We know it doesn't mean that because Paul has already done that in this very letter. Back in chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, Paul was not shy about telling us about applying various less than nice adjectives to these false teachers. If you can remember, he referred to them as rebellious, as deceitful, as disobedient, as leading whole families astray away from the truth, as professing to know God but denying him by their actions, as being defiled in their minds and in their consciences. So it does not mean, it cannot mean that we're not allowed to identify evil. Likewise, Titus has already been instructed to reprove and correct the Christians. So what this cannot mean is that we're to use our speech in such a way as to never hurt anyone's feelings. It can't mean that, because Paul's probably already done that. In fact, the way that he describes unbelievers in the section that follows probably does the same. However, it does mean that from the spirit that we operate, we're not to be evil. So when we rebuke or when we deal with people, the spirit, the motive that we have is not to be evil. It's to be from the Holy Spirit. So our motive behind speaking should not be one of like malicious, vindictive anger or just trying to do damage or just trying to belittle other people to make ourselves look better. Uh, our spirit ultimately, even, even when it's confrontational, is to be loving. He continues in verse 2. To malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. This uh, phrase, showing consideration for all men, is, is a little bit tricky to put into English. I don't know what translations you have, but there's a number of different translations for this one word in Greek. And it, it can be something like yielding or having a gentle disposition, a gentle spirit. It can be translated courteous to all men. 
can be translated consideration for all men like the NASV does, does here. The basic idea is something that like Christians are supposed to be patient and loving towards everyone, especially believers, but also including unbelievers. And we know that Paul is thinking also about unbelievers because of what he says in verse 3. So in verse 3, he says, For we also were once foolish ourselves. He's speaking of unbelievers. It's as if, it's as if Paul is saying that he recognizes how difficult it is as a believer to live among non-believers. And the way that he categorizes them here uh, spells that out. Disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our lives in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. So <laughs> Paul doesn't seem to be pulling any punches about describing unbelievers. But nevertheless, we are in relationship to them to be, to be loving and to be patient. The fruits of a mind that are given over to to a life without God are these very things. Deceitful, foolish, disobedient, angry, lustful, foolish. But by contrast, the mind of a Christian, which is centered on God and then lives their life by the power of the Holy Spirit, that results in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, Paul writes, there is no law. Now, why though? Why are we supposed to be that way? If they're not going to reciprocate, and that's not always the case, but if they're not going to reciprocate, if they're not going to extend to you the same loving patience that you're commanded to give them, then why would we do it? <clears throat> to which, once again, I want you to notice that Paul is about to give us the theological basis for why we would do this. And what he has to say why we would do this is because we were once in the same boat. That's what he has to say. So his description of unbelievers as disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various, his various lusts and so on, uh, that's us. That was at one time in our lives, us. But then the kindness, the loving goodness of God appeared and saved us from, our, from ourselves. He appeared. Now, as we've already noted, the theological basis for why we would be nice, why would we be loving, why would we be patient, is because we were in the same position, but that's not the end of it. While we were in that position, God loved us. While we were his enemies, while we were in open rebellion against the Lord with nothing to offer, he loved us. In fact, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says that Christ demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. While we're still sinners, he dies for us. Doesn't wait for us to become good enough or to bring something to the table in exchange for it as though, <clears throat> as though we had something to offer. He does it while we have nothing to give. God loved us while we have nothing to give. In fact, as Paul continues, he saved us. Not so far. In verse 4, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Now, uh, this is not the first time that Paul writes something like this. This notion of, we were once this way, but then we became something different. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes something very similar. He writes this, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Such were some of us. But then we were washed. We were sanctified. We were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the Spirit of our God. God's great love towards us was proven in the work of Jesus Christ, who came to us while we were unworthy. And as a result of that, we're to do good deeds, one of which means that we're to treat non-believers the same way that Christ 
God has treated us while we were in the same position. Now, um, <clears throat> there is a, there's more than one occasions now where, where we've been talking about good deeds and it's come up. And so it's imperative that we, that we ferret out the right relationship between good deeds and salvation. Um, and this is, this is very, very critical. In Christianity, the relationship between good deeds and faith or good deeds and salvation is that we, we do them, so they're in the formula, but we do them in response to salvation. We do them as an act of gratitude for what we could not otherwise ever do. And that's different because every other religious system that I'm aware of does it exactly backwards. That is, every other religious system would, would seek to keep you enslaved by having you guess whether or not you've been good enough to ever enter paradise. It's really only Christianity that begins with the premise that you're not good enough now and you never will be. But take heart, because God himself condescended to men to save them while they were unworthy. Now, if, if you've ever had a life experience where you came face to face with Jesus, the truth of the gospel was proclaimed to you then there is no staying the same. That's not an option. Once you come face to face with the truth of the gospel, it becomes impossible to stay the same. You can either reject him, hearing the gospel, I want nothing to do with this. And as a result, your heart becomes even more hard, more bitter, more envious, more foolish, more easily deceived. And that category of people is not just those who have heard the gospel and like, I don't want anything to do with it. That category of people are also those who have heard the gospel and done nothing with it. Pretending somehow as, as though there were a middle ground or there were some fence to ride in, in the neutral position, and there isn't. They are effectively denying him by their inaction. But there is another group. There's a group of people that have had the truth proclaimed to them, the gospel, the good news of their salvation by a God who saves the unworthy, and they responded by recognizing it, by agreeing with it, by humbling themselves before it, and in faith, surrendering their lives to the Lord Jesus. And as a result of that, from that point forward, they live their lives in honor of this new father they have in heaven, this new king. That group, those ones are called Christians. And they haven't just changed, they're made new entirely. In fact, in Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, in chapter 5, verse 17, he, he actually writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, the new things have come. He saved us. Not on our deeds, and not on the basis of our deeds, but by his mercy. And while it may not be cogent to stop in the middle of an argument, I feel maybe compelled to just say, praise God for his mercy. Praise God for his kindness and his love that he would save such as we. Paul continues in verse 6 by telling us, perhaps reminding us that the measure of our salvation has been given to us richly. Verse 6, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, abundantly, extravagantly, excessively. Which is to say, God is not stingy or withholding. Everything that you need, God has given you, chief among which is himself in his own Holy Spirit. And then we get to verse 7. It says, so that being justified by his grace we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This word justified uh, deserves some attention. Uh, it comes from the Greek word, the Greek root word, dk, meaning justice. But this word in Greek carries a very specific context of a courtroom scene. Uh, so imagine, if you can, imagine a courtroom scene where the accused comes in uh, and there's a judge and there's a jury and they lay out all the charges, they lay out all the evidence, everything is considered, and then there's a verdict rendered. And based on how the verdict is rendered, there, there's a declaration of whether or not this person is innocent or guilty. They're declared guilty, they take the sentence, and they go away forever. 
If they're declared innocent, they're vindicated. And that's this word that Paul uses. It's the word that would have been used in a court of law for someone that had all of their charges dropped. In fact, the word can actually be translated as vindicated or acquitted. Now, I was thinking a lot about this word this week. I don't know if you um, followed the Kyle Rittenhouse trial situation at all. Uh, I, I was kind of loosely following that, and I, I was watching when the verdict read the counts that he was charged with. And if you're not familiar with the case, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, a young man involved in one of the most high-profile murders in recent American history, was assaulted by several people during the riots of Kenosha, even though we're not allowed to call them riots. <laughs> and he, he shot and killed two people. He was on trial for whether or not his action was justifiable in the law, being self-defense or, or murder. And I think quite obviously and rightly, he was acquitted on every charge. But I can remember him standing there, and the jury is reading each one of the counts, and after every one, not guilty. And I can remember, towards the end of it, Kyle just like bursts into tears and then collapses. I imagine a sense of overwhelming joy and relief. And as I was watching, I thought, that's me. That's me in Jesus. And that's you in Jesus. The word that Paul uses here is the word that all these charges have been read against you and you've been vindicated, you've been acquitted. So again, imagine a courtroom scene where you are the accused and you're standing before a judge, God himself, the almighty, infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful God of all creation. He knows every single thing about you. Everything that you've thought about doing, that you have done, that you've desired to do. Everything. He knows it all. The forces of darkness are there. And they're reminding the judge and you of all the evil things that you've ever done. And to make matters worse, the judge begins the courtroom by reminding everyone that even one broken law is, is warranting of death. You're guilty and you know you're guilty. A thousand times over you know you're guilty, and yet the charges are read one by one against you and every one of them dropped. <laughs> how, how can it be? Well, I'll tell you how it can be. The, the sentence that we deserve for the crimes that we committed have been paid on our behalf by the blood of the Lord Jesus. Again, praise God Almighty, for such a wonderful thing. And now realize this. The generosity of God to save does not end in salvation. I, I have come to believe that perhaps one of the most damaging things that we've done in the church, uh, doctrinally and in the lives of individual Christians, is the way that we talk about salvation. We tend to talk about salvation as though we're the end. And once we get a person saved, then that's kind of the whole essence of Christianity. And that, that is sadly just not even close to true. It's a wonderful thing when we can get people converted and they become followers of Jesus, but that's not the end. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of a whole new life, a whole new person, a whole new creation. Salvation, then, justification, is not the final blessing. It's the introductory blessing by which all of the other ones come. So God's generosity does not stop with just, just salvation. It continues beyond that. And I want you to notice, here in verse 7, Paul is trying to point that out. So in verse 7, he says, So that being justified, or saved, by his grace, we would be made heirs. Did you catch that? We're not saved for the sake of being saved. We're saved for the sake of becoming heirs. <laughs> for eternal life. This judge that you stand before is not just letting you off the hook. He, he wants to adopt you into his family. He wants to call you his own and bless you more than your mind could ever possibly grasp. And he wants to call you to the same work that he has done to you. Again, praise God for his generosity, for his salvation, for the foolish such as us. 
And from this point forward then, having recognized, having humbled ourselves before the Lord, we acknowledge that he saved us and then we live our lives to honor this new king in good works. And one of those things is that we treat unbelievers the same way that we ourselves have been treated. I want to focus in on verse 3 just by way of ending this. In verse 3, again, it says, For we also once were foolish ourselves. Now, I, I think uh, quite often, and I don't, I don't mean this in a degrading way, but I think quite often Christians or people who have been around church world or they know Bible language a lot, they lose sight sometimes of the majesty, the grandeur of what God has offered just because it's so common. And I don't mean mundane, but like we're just so familiar with it. We, I think sometimes run the risk of, of losing sight of how, how grand this thing actually is. So I want to tell you a story. And the story is, is of a conversion. And I am a sucker for conversion stories. I love them. Uh, and this story, this story in particular resonates quite deeply because there are elements of it that mirror my own conversion. And the story is about a man named Albert Camus. And perhaps some of you know that name. Albert Camus is one of the most, one of the most, was one of the most famous, influential atheists of the 20th century. He's a French philosopher and existentialist. Now, um, he was an unbelievably gifted writer. He won the Nobel P Peace Prize, I think, when he was 44, uh, and so on and so forth. Unlike, unlike the new atheists, though, of our day, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and the like, Camus was unique in that he was not afraid, he was not pretending that morality could exist outside of a transcendent God. And he knew that well. In fact, he argued well that the logical end of atheism was abject despair. And it was reflected a lot in his writing. And neither was he given to the intellectually fashionable trend of atheists then and now to become an avowed Marxist. He was... He hated totalitarianism because he had, he had fought in the war against it. In the mid-1950s, he was living in Paris, and there was a world-famous organist that came to play the organ at this church for a while. His name was Marcel Dupree, and Camus wanted to hear him play. So he came to the church and kind of sat in the back and listened to him play. At about the same time, they had a new pastor come on like an interim basis named Howard Muma. I think is how his name is pronounced. And Howard Muma and Camus became friends. They would meet, and they would talk about God and philosophy and the like, and they would have lunch together. And over the course of time, uh, Camus reveals that he doesn't own a Bible, at least not what he can read. He has a Latin Vulgate. He can't read Latin. So as us pastors are prone to do, when Howard hears that he's looking for truth, when people are asking us about where to find truth, he, he gets him a Bible in French so he can read it. For Camus, though, the Bible did not become a keepsake or like a decorative house piece or a coaster, as it is for many Christians. For Camus, he began to read it rigorously, taking notes. All the while, they would keep meeting, talking about what he's reading. One day, Camus confesses to Howard that he, he detects something in Scripture that can be found. He doesn't know what it is yet, but he sees something there. Something, he, he argues, that atheism could not or would not ever offer. He wants to find it. He knows it's there, and so he keeps reading. One fateful day, he's meeting with Howard. They're talking about John chapter 3 in the story of Nicodemus. And Camus confesses that he rather feels a lot like Nicodemus and that he's come to Jesus in the cover of night, worried about his, about his own reputation. But he, he's curious. He wants to know. And so he also confesses that he, he doesn't understand this new birth thing, as Nicodemus didn't either. To which then Howard takes the opportunity and tells him the gospel. That if we repent of our sins, humble ourselves before the Lord, then we receive forgiveness and become new entirely. To which then Camus one of the most prolific atheists of the 20th century, squarely looks Howard in the face 
eyes filled with tears and says, Howard, I'm ready. I want this. I want to give my life to this. It's a beautiful moment. A few months later, Camus dies in a tragic and somewhat random car accident. It took him an entire lifetime to find his way out of the crushing despair that is life apart from God. And that was you. That was you, and that was me. Are you beginning to get at least some idea of how big, how grand, how marvelous, how majestic this thing actually is? I wonder this morning, I wonder this morning if you realize the magnitude of what God has done for you, of all that he has prepared for you yet to come. Or if you're sitting here or watching online and, and you're flirting with it, or you've denied it entirely, I wonder if also like Camus, you would join hands with him and say, I'm, I'm ready, I want this. I wanna surrender my life to him. I would love to talk to you about the Lord Jesus. I would love to talk to you. I would love to give you what has been given to me for free. And I know at this point, it's somewhat easy to say, it's simply too good to be true. And the wisdom of the word seems to anticipate that very thought. Look at the first couple words of verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. <laughs> it's marvelous. It's beautiful. It's, it's so grand that I'm just going to read it, and we'll close with that. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. But then, but then, the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, not just in history, but also in your life, in my life. And he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we will be made heirs according to the promise of eternal life. And this is a trustworthy statement. Let's pray. Father, um, your, your generosity towards us is is so overwhelming, it's so grand and wonderful that maybe sometimes the best thing to say is, is simply thank you. Now, Lord, we, we want to live our lives in such a way that we not only acknowledge the reality of this, but that we, we obey you. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us the theological foundation, that we would think about these things often, and in so doing, we would be gifted a joy that undergirds everything else. And that we would be able to treat others the same way that you have treated us. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.